We worship this morning according to the common service on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson for today from Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, 
and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So far the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 72, he will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The desert tribes will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him and all nations will serve him. So far the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Sanctify us through your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Alleluia. Holy Gospel is written in the 20th chapter according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 20th verse. Glory and the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. You drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed, as printed on page 19 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Philippians from chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Paul writes this letter to a congregation who brings him joy. The letter to the Philippians is called the epistle of joy. It is the great theme, the humility and the partnership in the gospel and the faith and the love and the rich generosity of the Philippians despite their deep poverty always bring a smile to Paul's face. But every soul and every congregation of souls has room for improvement. And so in this epistle, Paul bids them to grow in their humility and their harmony among each other. He does this on the basis not of the law, 
but on the basis of all that Christ has done for us and all that Christ Jesus has been to us. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Be like-minded, Paul says to them. Now, he's not talking about an outward union, but he's talking about an inner unity of heart and mind, which finds itself in agreement in the teachings of the Bible. And so it is, as they find themselves in agreement, Christ's apostles, they were as different as snowflakes in temperament, in personality, a potpourri of personalities, huh? And yet, they became the glorious company of the apostles because they stood united in the teachings of the Master. They were to act in love, not out of self-interest, because it wasn't about self, but it was about doing the best thing for the best interests of the other. And Paul says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, making of Christ's church or Christ's people some sort of stage for your ego or for your recognition. And he says, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. In the ancient Greek world, in their society, amid their teachers and moralists, humility was not considered a virtue. It was considered a sign of weakness and cowardice, whereas pride and self-assertiveness were considered signs of manliness and courage. Nothing much has changed. Celebrities, athletes, Beat their chests like apes. Huh? We find people routinely taking courses on self-assertiveness in all kinds of ways, new and improved, to exercise power and manipulation over other people. Used to be, you know, when a child was a little bit shy, that was considered kind of a virtue. Now you take the kid to counseling for a lack of self-esteem. Here, in the epistle to the Philippians, Paul says, it's about Christ. Our Christian life is rooted in Christ's humiliation. It is encouraged by his exaltation. Your attitude, says Paul, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The reporter wrote a piece on what it was like for Truman when he left the White House, for Eisenhower when he went back to his farm in Gettysburg, for Johnson when he went back to the ranch in Texas, for Nixon when he resigned in disgrace, for Ford who barely got a chance at it, for Carter, who cried on the plane on the way back to his peanut farm in Georgia. And for Reagan and Bush and Clinton. It was one of those things where you say, what must that be like? 
to be in arguably the most powerful position on earth. And then when that comes to an end, when the whole world stopped and networks broke into their programming because you had something to say, and now nothing. No more hail to the chief every time you walk into a public gathering. No more Air Force One. What a plane. Hmm? No more helicopter ready to take off in moments. No delays. Secret Service gets tailored way back. No butlers, valets, personal attendants. The older George Bush woke up the morning after he left the presidency, sat up in bed, waited for his coffee and newspaper to be brought to him. Wife Barbara said, get up and get it yourself. What must that be like to be riding so high? And then all of a sudden, nothing. But what Christ did for us is infinitely greater. When he set aside the full and continuous use of his divine powers became our brother and humbled himself. Here in his great humiliation, Christ gives his very self to us. And when a teenage girl says, I was just humiliated, well, she means she was embarrassed. But that's not what we mean when we talk about Christ's humiliation. In the humiliation of Christ, we are talking about the fact that Christ, the God-man, set aside the full and continuous use of his divine powers, which he always possesses, in order to save us. But before you can even talk about the humiliation of Christ and his exaltation, you've got to talk about who he is. Here, Paul says Christ is in very nature, God. Paul says in Romans 9 that Christ is God over all, forever praised. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Gospel of John calls Jesus God repeatedly and says that all things were made by him. The first epistle of John says that Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. The epistle to the Hebrews emphasizes repeatedly that Christ is God, equal with the Father from all eternity. Now don't nod your head at this catechism lesson. For you see, from the Jehovah's Witness who's standing on your doorstep, to the loosey-goosey guy who thinks Jesus is just ah, one more reli religious philosopher among many others. The world is filled with people who do not get this. Jesus Christ is God. And a Savior who is anything less than God himself is no Savior at all. If Christ is not who he says he is, then he is an imposter, and we are lost. In the early centuries of the Christian church, false teachers denied the very Godhead of Christ. The true teachers of the Bible, they rose up with the Nicene and Athanasian creeds to confess Jesus Christ, the God-man, was, is, and ever shall be God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But it is the heart of that Christmas account, isn't it? That God the Son took upon himself a human nature by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary and became fully man. Sinless, perfect, true man. And yet he is not two Christ but one. Not half God and half man, but totally God and totally man in one person. 
in order to save us. But in order to save us, these powers which he always has, always possesses, well, he humbled himself. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He did not make full and continuous use of all his power. He was born in a stable, not in a fancy hospital. He became tired after preaching to the multitudes, hungry in the wilderness. He allowed men to tie him up, beat him, and nail him to a cross. To be sure, there were times during his earthly ministry when he drew aside the curtain, when he gave people a glimpse of his glory. He walked on water. He fed the multitudes. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He stilled the storm. He was transfigured in glory on the mountain. But for the most part, he drew a curtain over that. So that as Paul puts it, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now the word that Paul uses there has reference to the plunder taken in battle, to the spoils of war, and how in ancient times, sometimes even today, when a country had conquered another, they came back home and they paraded through the streets in a grand triumph, all the spoils of battle, the stuff they had taken from the losers, as though to demonstrate their great victory and power. Though Christ is God himself, in his humiliation, he chooses not to parade his power, as it were, in the streets. When the princes of the Jewish nation pranced about at the foot of the cross, and they said, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross, he could have done so. Christ could have entered our world in blazing power and people would have been amazed, astounded, but not saved. And so for our sakes he humbled himself. And to what extent? The Bible says that he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being found in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, to what extent? Even to the point of death. To the obedience of death. The obedience you and I have failed to give to God, Christ gave to God, living the life we failed to live and dying the death that should have been ours, and he did this. All for you and me. All the way to death on a cross. But that price for salvation paid in full. Our sins forgiven. All of our debt to God paid by his perfect life and death. Now, now the Savior takes up the full use of his power on our behalf. We call this the exaltation. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In the Apostles' Creed, which you confessed this morning, the exaltation begins with that little phrase, He descended into hell. That is to demonstrate his victory over the devil. And on our side of the curtain, he rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. This is his great power by which he now takes up and reigns, says St. Paul. 
Here we have St. Paul's summary in another epistle. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now what does all that mean? It means that you and I can never again say to God, you don't know what it's like down here. In his humiliation and his exaltation, he has shown us where our life is rooted and how it is encouraged. When you are tired, you are worn out. Christ says to you, I'm your brother. I know what it's like to be tired and worn out. When you're racked with pain on a hospital bed, Christ will stand at your bedside and he will say, I too know what it is like to be in pain. And sooner or later, I will relieve it forever. When you experience everybody getting up and walking out on you, Christ will sit down beside you in your solitude. And he will say, I too know what it's like to be lonely. My own brothers did not believe in me. And one who ate bread with me sold me for a handful of silver. When you feel guilt, like an elephant standing on your chest. Christ says, I can lift that clean off of you. And I have made your guilt mine. And you don't have to carry that anymore. When you can't seem to find a glad moment in your life. Christ says, I too know what it is to be sad. I am a man acquainted with grief. When the Bible says to you, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And be imitators of God. And you cry out, who can imitate God? Christ says to you, well, abide with me. Keep company with me. Learn from me. Catch something of my spirit. And go forth and in some measure be to your parent, your spouse, your child, your neighbor what I have been to you. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
It hath pleased Almighty God to summon out of this veil of tears to our eternal home the soul of Hazel Meyer, who departed this life last Sunday at the age of 90. Services were on Friday here at the church. Let us pray. O Lord God, thou Lord of life and death, who turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men, we give thee thanks for all the mercies which during her long life thou didst bestow upon this our beloved sister now fallen asleep. Especially do we thank thee for having brought her to the knowledge of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ. We pray thee comfort the survivors with thine everlasting comfort, and cheer them with the sweet hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant to the lifeless body rest in the bosom of the earth, and hereafter together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us all to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers for Lane Wyatt, who will undergo surgery on Tuesday, for Wilfred Stratman, who is hospitalized following surgery, and for Lori Stanley, who is recovering from surgery. We pray. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants and restore their strength. You gave your Son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with them and bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake. Amen. And let us also offer up a prayer of thanks for the 65th wedding anniversary of Herb and Bonnie Miller. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants throughout 65 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. You who have taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
welcome our visitors and invite you to sign the guest register. You're all invited downstairs for the fellowship time. Please greet each other.